wanted to preach to us around this topic of the overflow of obedience. And we are moving into a very powerful season as a church. And if you've never been a part of City Point before in this season, this is a season we like to call Faith, Love, Hope, where we stretch our faith, where we believe God for the most amazing things in our life. We believe God for the impossible things to become possible. And this is a very interesting story to me. I love in in verse 14, it notes that this is the third time that Jesus reveals Himself to the disciples after He was raised from the dead. And I'm not sure about you, but every time I read about Jesus being raised from the dead, something in my spirit comes alive. And I am reminded that we do not serve a dead God that is in a coffin or a grave somewhere. We serve a God that is alive, that is active. We serve a God that can move this year in 2024 that not even death, hell and the grave could overcome our King. So many things are trying to overcome Jesus. And even in today's day and age, so many things are trying to overcome the church and try to overcome Jesus. But can I tell you, Jesus cannot be overcome by anything because He defeated death, hell and the grave all those years ago. He is alive. And and right before we read this story, we, we see that the disciples were commissioned. In fact, it says that Jesus breathed upon the disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit in this moment. So He commissions them. And then all of a sudden we turn over to the next chapter and they are back fishing in a boat. In other words, they get commissioned and then they go back to what is comfortable. Their commission, God breathes the Holy Spirit on them and then all of a sudden they go back. And so many times we read this story and so many times we read the stories about the disciples and especially, I'm not sure about you, I read about Peter and I just start laughing. I'm like, why would you do that? Like Peter was the guy that did the things that no one, like everyone thought to do, but they didn't actually do it. And Peter was that guy in the friendship group that did it. You know, we, we've all got that person that everyone thinks about the crazy ideas and the wild ideas, but there's one person that actually goes through with it. And that was Peter out of the disciples. And, and we find, we, we look at this story and, and we laugh at Peter. We're like, as if you get commissioned and then you go back to the very thing you were doing before you met Jesus. But the reality is, is so many of us as disciples of Jesus do the very same thing that we have a mission, we have a calling, we have a mandate on our life, but we go back to what is comfortable. We go back to what is comfortable because in reality, so many times we would prefer comfort over our calling, comfort over our commission, comfort over our cross. And just as we approach this faith, love, hope season, I just felt God prompt on my heart to not let comfortability and not let the comfortable steal, kill and destroy what God wants to build in and through us in this season of faith, love, hope. Because we are living in a culture of comfort. It's all about comfort. Like people just wanna work a four hour work week and sit on the comfortable couch at home and have everything come to them. That's why we have Uber Eats and we don't just have Uber Eats, we got DoorDash now and we've got all these other apps. And I'm like, okay, are they a trusted company or should I go with someone else? But then they do pretty good deals. So it's like, okay, I want that because that's comfortable. But we are living in a society of comfort. But I believe that as we enter this season of faith, love, hope, the enemy is gonna try to use comfort to steal, kill and destroy the plan that God has for this season. And I wanna stand my ground and say, I'm not gonna let comfort steal, kill and destroy the plan that God has for my life in the season of faith, love, hope. And I believe there's some keys in in this story that we can take away and take into faith, love, hope season as we consider what it means for us. So we're gonna read this story again and we're gonna stop and start at a couple of key points that I wanted to go through tonight. It says this in in verse three, well, Peter says this, he says, I'm going out to fish. In some translations, it says, I'm going back to fish. In other words, what Peter was saying in this moment is I am retreating. I am going back to what is comfortable. I am going back to what I used to do before I was called. I, I don't know, and he's even got this position and this posture. He's like, I don't know what's next. He found himself in a season of confusion because God had commissioned them, but not really given them a next step as to what to do. So he went back to, to what was comfortable in a season of confusion and in a season where he didn't have clarity. And so many times in our life, we do the very same thing that Peter did. 
in a season of confusion, in a season where we don't have clarity, in a season where we don't know the next step, we don't go forwards, we don't seek God for the next direction. Instead, we go back to what we already know. But I believe that in 2024, as a generation and as a church, we need to stand our ground and say, you know what, no matter what confusion comes my way, no matter what uncertainty comes my way, I am never going back to what I used to do before Jesus. I am never going back to comfort. And it's not something that is circumstantial. It's not like I'm not going back for this season because it works for now. No, you gotta make a stand and say, no, I am never going back. I am never going back to what I used to do. I'm not going back to comfort. I'm not going back to sin. I'm not going back to the clubs. Oop, there it is. Sorry, I had to put it in there. I'm not going back to that addiction. I'm not going back to that relationship. I'm not going back to that lifestyle. I'm not going back to that shame. I'm not going back to my past. I'm not going back because what I have found in Jesus is too good to go back to what I used to have. It's got to be better. In fact, it can't just be better. It needs to be immeasurably more better than what you have right now. And so many times we believe this lie that just because we are called and commissioned by God, it means that we're safe, by the, we're safe from the attacks of the enemy. So many times we believe this lie that once you're a Christian, you can just switch off because the enemy isn't going to attack you. But can I tell you, that is one of the greatest lies that you would ever hear. Because something about the enemy is he seeks and sabotages significance. In John 10, 10, it says that the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. Why would he steal something that isn't of any value? If, if you're a robber, and not that I was ever a robber, kind of, but that is my testimony, B, BC days, let's not talk about that. But you don't go after something that is invaluable. You go after the most valuable thing. And maybe people find themselves in this place tonight where you are getting attack after attack after attack. Can you be encouraged that there is something significant on your life? Because the enemy is not gonna steal, kill and destroy something of insignificance. In fact, when God calls you and God commissions you, you better be alert. You better be of sober mind because the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we are living in a time where so many people just switch off as soon as they're called. So many people get a platform. So many people enter into leadership and they're just switched off. And and it's almost like they forget that this is a spiritual battle and the enemy wants to take us out. But we gotta realise that there is a real war going on and that the enemy has come to steal, kill and destroy the things on our life. Some of us get a dream, we, we get a vision, we get a word, we hear God and we abandon it because we are in uncertainty or fear comes or comfort comes. But can you be encouraged tonight to not abandon the words of God over your life, not abandon the call of God upon your life? It may not be the most comfortable thing, but it is gonna be the most significant path that you can follow for your life. In fact, I've come to realise that there's no such thing as being called and comfortable at the same time. Like I've never met someone that said, when I follow Jesus, life got a whole lot more comfortable. Like, let's be real. When I followed Jesus, life became a whole lot more uncomfortable. (laughs) But that is why we have the Holy Spirit who is called a comforter. Why would we receive the Holy Spirit that is called a comforter if we are not called to go into uncomfortable situations in our faith? God is not just gonna give us a comforter for comfort situations. (laughs) He's gonna give us a comforter so that in uncomfort, we can seek the Holy Spirit and what He has over our life. So many times as well, we believe this, that when we are commissioned by God, we can live a measured and balanced life. I'm so sorry to tell you that that's not true. As soon as you say yes to Jesus, as soon as you are commissioned, man, your schedule needs to you know, revolve around God. Your, your, your time, your talent, all these things, they need to revolve around God because that is what a commissioned life is. It is a life that is called to be radical and holy. Radical and holy. We need to realise that Jesus is everything that we have. When we read on in this story, I find this so interesting. Peter says, I'm going out to fish. And some Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. Peter says, I'm going out to fish. I'm going back to what I used to do. 
I'm gonna do something that's comfortable. And his friends, the ones that were, tr- that, that were supposed to keep him accountable, the ones that were supposed to call the best out of him, don't say, maybe don't do that because Jesus just commissioned us. They say, no, 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 we're gonna go with you. And I believe that we, we are living in a generation where it, it is almost uncommon to call someone out based on a bad decision that they are making. We, we are living in a society that gets offended by absolutely everything. And when our friend makes a decision to go back to the life that they used to, so many of us just sit on the sidelines and spectate them and let them do it. In fact, some of us pat them on the back as they go to do that thing. And we're not willing to have the uncomfortable conversation to call them out on what they are doing. Now, the Bible says this, that don't point out the speck in someone else's eye when you got a plank in your own. You don't wanna be that guy that is just judgmental and pointing the finger and re- realizing that you don't have any mistakes. Fact check, everyone has mistakes. <laughs> You have mistakes, you are not perfect. Sorry if I'm offending some people, but it is the truth. And I'm sorry, sometimes the truth is offensive. So many times we we are are, are so worried by offence that we remain silent or we pat people on the back as they are turning away from Jesus. Can I tell you, that is not the call of God on the church. The call of God on the church is when our friends are struggling, when our friends say, I'm gonna do what's comfortable. When your friend says, hey, I'm sleeping with my boyfriend or girlfriend, you say, hey, that's probably not the best thing for your life. Would you see God? I'm sorry if it's countercultural, but it is the way that we're called to live. Let's not be like the disciples where they say, we'll go with you. When we know our friend is in sin, we know that that decision isn't gonna be good for their life. We know that it's gonna end up really bad, but we we don't wanna offend them. So we remain silent just so that we can keep the relationship. One of the most selfless things that you can do is encourage people to chase after Jesus. And even if they don't like you for it then, they'll like you for it later. There have been so many leaders in my life that have called me out on things and it has hurt in the moment. I'm like, I'm gonna block you. I'm gonna... I'm never talking to you again, but I was so grateful for it later. They saved me so much time and so many lessons to be learned. We gotta come to this resolution that we will do it with grace and love, but we will do it. I'm gonna call people out on things that aren't gonna glorify God with grace and love, but I will do it. It's important that we do it with grace and love, but it's important that you do it in the first place. We read on in this story and it goes on to say this. So, so they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Has anyone ever been fishing before? Five fishermen in the church, that's awesome. Now, have you ever been fishing and caught nothing? It is like one of the most frustrating things on planet earth. Like you, you go out and you get the bait and you get stinky and you're like, here we go. I'm gonna bring something home for my family. It's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna walk through the door. I'm gonna be like, Matty, I caught this massive fish. Look at it. And you go down and, and one hour goes by and two hours go by and three hours go by. And you're like, oh no, I've caught absolutely nothing. And you know what's even worse than catching absolutely nothing? When people are like, you know, they're, they're down by the water and they're having their afternoon walk and they go up to you and they go, hey, Have you caught anything? And you have to say, no, I've caught nothing. Like I've been here getting stinky. I've I've, I've carved out hours so I can come down to catch absolutely nothing. But I think there's an important lesson to be learned here. It's so embarrassing for these guys even because they were fishermen. Like I just picture the disciples looking at Peter and be like, you used to do this for a job. Like I'm grateful you quit. But you've got to realise when you go back, it's always going to lead to nothing. When you go back to that sin and you go back to that shame and you go back to your past, it will offer a lot, but it will give you nothing. Be assured of that. When you do things in your own strength, regardless of how you do it or how long you've been doing it, it's always going to lead to nothing. We've got to realise that, that we need to add Jesus into the equation of our life. 
In fact, we don't just need to add Him to the equation. He needs to be everything in our life. And if you do things in your own strength and you're trying to do it in your own accord, don't be disappointed when you get nothing because Jesus is everything that we have. When you are obedient to His will and His voice over your life, a grace and a blessing follows that. And in verse four, it goes on to say this, it says early in the morning. And I just love that it specifies this was early in the morning because the Bible says that God's mercies are new every morning. And I don't know what happened yesterday. I don't know what happened today, but you can be assured of God's mercy being new for you tomorrow. I know that every time that we wake up and every time that we seek Him, He is there to hear us and He, he, he is there with arms wide open. And we read on and, and it says, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. We, we don't know why this is, but we can assume a couple of things. You know, it was early in the morning, meaning that maybe it was dark and they couldn't see Him. Maybe it was because of the distance that was between them and the shore. Maybe it was because of their confusion and their distraction on catching nothing. But have you ever found yourself there where Jesus is in the picture of your life, but you don't even recognise that He is there? Maybe because of darkness that surrounds you, maybe because of disappointment that surrounds you, maybe because you know there, there is almost a non-clarity around who Jesus is in your life. But can I encourage you with this is Jesus is always there. In your good days, in your bad days, every day He is there. He is standing on the shore saying, hey, I'm over here, would you just focus on me? And so many times when we are in a, a season of confusion and we are in a season of uncertainty, we focus on everything else but Jesus. We focus on everything else. We're, we're worried about the disappointment and we're worried about stepping out and we're, we're worried about the comfort and we're, we're worried about these things. We are so self-focused so many times that we don't even realise that Jesus is there. But it's like a camera. Something can be in the shot, but maybe it's not in focus. And I believe that in this story, that's almost what's happening. Jesus is there. He's on the shore. He's saying, I'm right here. But they did not recognise who He was because they weren't focused on Him. Can I encourage you? He is always there. He never leaves us, nor will He forsake us. That is what the Bible says. You just got to recognise that He's there. And just because He is unrecognisable doesn't mean that He's unreachable. So many times we think that because He is unrecognisable, because we can't see Him in our moment, then He's unreachable, but He is always reachable. And we read on to Jesus saying this in verse five. He called out to them, he said, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. I love Jesus always asks the questions that no one else wants to ask. Like, I, I reckon so many of them wanted to ask Peter, we haven't caught, like, have you caught anything? But they just weren't game because he went out on the boat and it was his idea and they're like, we don't wanna offend Peter. But Jesus goes, hey friends, have you caught anything? And I love the first word that Jesus says to the disciples here. Because we've got to realise that He has commissioned them, He has called them. In fact, it specifies to us that this isn't the first time that He is appearing to the disciples. It is the third time that He is appearing to the disciples. Yet they are out in the boat. Yes, they, they've lost their way. They've gone back to something that is comfortable. They've gone back to something that they did before Jesus even called them. And His first response isn't this, Hey, sinners, hey, the people that betray me, hey, what the heck are you doing? No, His first words to them is friends. And can I encourage you that no matter how many times you go back, no matter how many times you lose your way, no matter how many times you stuff it up and make mistakes, Jesus is standing there with arms wide open saying, hey, friends. And there's some people in this room, I believe tonight, you feel like you've made too many mistakes that Jesus is pointing a finger at you. He is not pointing a finger at you. He is there with arms wide open saying, friend, would you just recognise that I am standing on the shore? That I'm standing there. In verse six, we, we read on. And that reminds me of this scripture that says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, no mistake that you have made no sin, no, no past thing. No, if you feel like you've abandoned the calling that God has for your life, it is not abandoned because we serve a Jesus of second chances that is there and He wants you to run to Him. In verse six, we read on it, it says, He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number 
of fish. It wasn't when they heard. It wasn't when they did it in their own strength. But it was when they were obedient to the word that Jesus had for them that changed everything. It doesn't say when they heard. No, no, no. It says when they did. Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side of the boat. And they could have had every excuse in the book. Like we we think that this is a radical fishing plan. But if you've ever been fishing before, you kind of realise that if you go from one side of the boat to the next side of the boat, like you've only changed kind of the, the place that you were fishing a couple of feet. Like, it's not like he's like, hey, go 100 metres down the stream. No, he's like, hey, just cast your nets on the other side. And Peter could have been standing there saying, no, we're not gonna do that. Like we've been up all night. But they were obedient. They were obedient. They didn't ask questions. They just said, well, we've tried everything else. We've done it in our own strength and it has amounted to nothing. We might as well listen to the voice of Jesus over our life. We need to come back to obedience being our only option with God. So many times we have all these options on the option list and obedience is number three. We wanna do everything else. We wanna do it in our own strength before we're obedient to the way that God has over our life. But this Scripture tells us there's two things that we can have. It's either obedience or nothing. And I believe that in this hour as a church, it's either obedience or nothing. It's not like obedience and half obedience. It's not like obedience or, you know, we might see a small revival over here. No, it's obedience or nothing. It's either we do it in God's strength or we do it in our strength. Obedience changes everything. Your your mandate on your life is not just to know the Word. It's not just to sit and hear the Word on a Sunday. No, it is to do the Word. It says when they did, when they were obedient, when they stepped out in faith, this is what changed everything. What would this region look like? What would this church look like? What would your university look like? What would your school look like? What would your family look like if you said, God, I wanna be obedient? God, just one word, just say one word, say one thing you want me to do. And it might be the most radical thing ever, but I'm gonna do it because I realise that obedience changes everything. In fact, there is an overflow to obedience. It says, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. There is an overflow. When you're obedient to God, it comes with a blessing. And the overflow of obedience is always blessing and not just measured blessing. Not just like a blessing that's like, oh, that's kind of nice, but a blessing that is unquantifiable. A blessing that it says they couldn't even bring in the net because God blessed them so much. It's like a Malachi 3.10 blessing that says, will I not open the floodgates of heaven and, and pour out so much that you can't even store what is happening because of your obedience? But the reality is, is so many of us want the blessing, but we don't want the obedience. God, would You bless me? God, would You bless my marriage? God, would You bless my job? Would You, would you give me that promotion? God, would you, would you bless my finances? God, would You bless my university? But if You say something for me to do, nah, I, I don't want it. That's not it. You need to be obedient to see the blessings overflow into your life. And we read on in this story and it says this, verse seven, that the disciple whom Jesus loved being John said to Peter is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him. If he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other, disciple, the other disciples followed him in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire burning with coals and fish on it. That is so interesting that they'd been out all night. Like, and Jesus just, He didn't even go out. He was on the shore and He had fish on the coals. Like, how good is Jesus? He's just so good. And some bread as well. I love, it says that Peter didn't wait for everyone else but instead it said He jumped into the water. He jumped into the water. There's something on this. Peter realised something. In this moment, I could just imagine the emotion and the things that he's going through. 
See, Peter hadn't been affirmed for denying Jesus three times yet. It was just after this story that he'd been affirmed. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He says it three times to undo the denials. How good is God that His grace is enough to cover you, even if you do it again and again and again and again. And it's not a license to do what you want. No, no, no. It just magnifies the goodness of our God that even when we do fall, He is there. But you could imagine the emotion. He's like, I, this, is, this is the one I denied. This is the one that just commissioned me. And then once again, I go back to comfort. And it says he, he got on his outer garment. It would have been freezing cold. It was early in the morning. I'm not sure if you've ever gone into the ocean. All, all the people that do Red Frog School, he's like early in the morning. It, it is not pleasant. Peter created the ice bath trend, I reckon. In, in here, but, but you could just imagine the emotion. He's like, I don't care what everyone else is doing. I, I don't care about the things that I was just blessed with. No, no, I, I've got to get to Jesus because you've got to realise that, that when Jesus is your everything, you're willing to do anything. He threw comfort aside. He threw convenience aside. He threw being dry aside. There could have been sharks in the water for all He knows. There, there, there could have been so many things, but He didn't weigh up the cost. He just jumped all in for Jesus. And not only that, he, He's jumping into uncertainty. He's jumping. He's taking a leap of faith here to get to Jesus. But Peter recognised something so significant is that we sometimes have to take a leap of faith. We've got to jump out of the, the, the spot of comfortability so that Jesus can pour out the blessings in our life. And why so many times don't we take the faith step? Why don't we take that leap? Because we're fearful, we're, we're worried. It's unmeasurable. We're like, we don't even know what's gonna happen. But can I tell you, every time you are going in the direction of Jesus, He is gonna bless you. And I don't know what the exact outcome is gonna be, but I know that it, you are gonna be followed with grace and favour all the days of your life when you say, I'm going in the direction of Jesus. But not only that, Peter realised, I don't just want the blessing, I want the blesser. I don't just want the blessing. I, I want the one that blessed me. I, I want Him. We need to come to a resolve that is like this. We don't just want the blessing, God. We want You. God, I don't just want the stuff. I want Jesus. I don't just want the promotion. I want Jesus. I don't just want my business to flourish. I want Jesus. I don't just want my life group to grow. I want Jesus. Here's one that we gotta wrestle with. I don't just want revival. I want Jesus. I don't just want the things that happen out here. I need the one that has blessed me. Can I tell you, Jesus is not a means to an end. God is not a means to your end. It's not like you can use God just to be blessed and run away with the blessing. The Bible says He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one that called you and He is gonna be the end result and the end reward. And He is the greatest blessing that could ever happen to your life. It is not the stuff or the things or the promotion. It is Jesus. He is the greatest blessing, the greatest blessing. And then Jesus says this in verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. I find it so interesting that it says that the disciples were unable to bring in the net. But in Peter's desperation, he was the only one that climbed into the boat and got the net out for Jesus. The group of people were unable to do it in their own strength, but in his desperation, he was like, I don't care how heavy it is. Jesus has asked me to be obedient. I, I don't care about the weight. I, I don't care about the responsibility. If it's being obedient to the voice of God, I'm gonna do it over my life. And it was full of large fish, 153 to be exact. And we were sitting in a staff meeting about two weeks ago and uh, on one night of youth, we, we had 153 guys come to our man night, 153 girls come to our SWB and it kids at our 8.30 service, we had 153 kids come to 8.30. And we were there and we're like, there has to be something on this 153. Like that is just too uncommon for that to all take place. And I was reminded of this story. In fact, the number 153 means an overflow blessing from God. If you add up all the times Jesus blesses someone in the Gospels and you add all the four accounts together, it equals 153 people exactly. 
153 is the number of blessing. And I believe as a church, God was revealing to us that we are moving into a season of overflow blessing. We are moving into a season where we're gonna be obedient to His voice and His way and His will. And there's gonna be things that are gonna come our way that are gonna be immeasurable, but it's gonna require radical obedience. It's not like God just wants to give us the blessing. No, He wants us to be obedient so that we would see that blessing take place in this house. I believe that's not just for kids and youth. I believe that is for City Point Church in this season of Faith, Love, Hope. May it be a season of overflow blessing, but may we be known for our obedience. But Jesus says, bring some of it to me. So here's the flow, here's the flow. Be obedient, receive the blessing, seek the blesser, and return some of the blessing to the blesser. What if the disciples in this story, I think about this all the time, say, well, no, I'm not gonna give you any of our fish. You've got your own fish. It's our fish, we caught the fish. It's, it's ours. No, I'm not bringing it to you. But they didn't do that, that'd be so silly. But how come in our life, we do that sometimes? How come sometimes Jesus blesses us with finances and He blesses us with a job and He blesses us with time and He blesses us with our gifts. And then He says, hey, would you give some of the blessing back to the blesser? Would you give it back to the Kingdom of God? And we go, no, it's mine. Newsflash, it's not yours. Newsflash, without Jesus, you would have none of that. Newsflash, if you didn't have Jesus, you wouldn't have got that promotion. Newsflash, if you didn't have Jesus, your business wouldn't be going the way that it is. Newsflash, you would have nothing. The Bible says in this story, when they did it in their own strength, it amounted to nothing. But when Jesus came, there was a blessing. How dare we go through a season of faith, love, hope and say, God, it is mine. I'm not gonna give you any of that. God, I'm not gonna be obedient with that because I take ownership over it. No, 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 no. We gotta give it back to the blesser. It is our responsibility. Be obedient, receive the blessing, seek the blesser and return some of the blessing to the blesser. I believe that this faith, love, hope, it's gonna be a powerful season. I believe that God is requiring some of us just like Peter to jump out of a boat of comfortability I believe what is gonna see a revival over this nation and what is gonna see Brisbane become the city of God is not a church that's playing it safe, doing measured things for God, but is a church that says, God, whatever you want, just speak a word, we're going to do it because we realise obedience leads to blessing. And we know that in our obedience, eternities are attached to that. God, in our obedience, we know that you're gonna take us to another level in our obedience. It's gonna unlock something on the inside of us. And I would hate to go through this season and for comfort to steal, kill and destroy the plan of what God has for you and, and what He wants to build in you and through you. I, I would hate for convenience in this season to steal, kill and destroy the plan that God has for you in this season. I remember the first time God said, Liam, would, would you give it faith, love, hope? I was, I was 18 years old. And he's like, hey, would you give this? And I'm like, God, I don't think you understand. I want that car because I had a 1996 Toyota Corolla and it was like a tin spaghetti on wheels and we got rid of it because it didn't have airbags. And it was like, it shouldn't have got a roadworthy, you know, those cars, I was driving one of those. Somehow Maddie still dated me in it. And I remember going, going to a house for the first time and Dave and Tracy are probably there like, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> like, I was like, God, I don't think you understand, I want this. God, I don't think you understand. I, I've been saving that for a long time, it's mine. God, I don't think you understand. I've reserved 10% for you, but you can't touch this because it's mine. But God was like, do it. And I remember something unlocked on the inside of me. I remember I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this thing in cash. So I went down to the ATM and I was like, if I'm gonna give, I'm gonna do it properly. And I rolled it up like I was part of the hood, you know, like put it in that faith, love, hope envelope. I'm like, here we go. But beyond there, there was an overflow blessing that came to my life. I can't even explain it. And we, we don't give to get, we don't give for the blessing. No, 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 I just wanted to bless God. I just wanted to be obedient to God because God was enough for me. But He always finds a way to get blessing back to you even when you're blessing Him. And I remember it unlocked something. I, I would just hate in this season, if God was asking people to step out and just because it was comfortable and convenient, 
just because it, it, you, had to, you had to jump out of that boat, just because you weren't willing to take that step of faith, God couldn't do what He wanted to do in your life. I pray that this faith, love, hope, we wouldn't just say that cliche, we're gonna have faith and love and hope, but we would have the deepest level of faith, the deepest level of love, and the deepest level of anticipation for what God is gonna do in this house. And I believe that as we do that, there's an overflow blessing coming to this house. We are living in a season of overflow blessing. I love at the end of that story, it says, this was now the third time Jesus appeared to His disciples after He was raised from the dead. The good news is this, is that Jesus died on the cross and three days later, He rose again. This story reveals so much about the character of our Saviour. He stands on the shore even when we make mistakes. And He's there with arms wide open saying, hey, if you try to do this life any other way, but through me, it's gonna lead to nothing. But there is one thing that will give you the fulfilment, the purpose and everything that you need in your life. And that thing is not money. The pursuit of money is endless. The pursuit of happiness is endless. The pursuit of, of getting that good job and that dream job is endless. But there is one thing that will fulfill the hole on the inside of your heart and His name is Jesus. He died on the cross for you to pay for your sin, your shame, your guilt, everything that weighs you down, everything that makes you feel empty. And He rose again three days later so that you could have a life of fulfilment, of purpose here on earth, but also so that you could spend eternity with Him and not separated from Him. So maybe tonight, maybe you are new here tonight and, and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. Can I tell you, it is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. Or maybe tonight, you feel like you've lost your way. You feel like you've gone back. And tonight you wanna come and recommit your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. If you're either one of those two people, I wanna pray for you tonight. So could we bow our heads and close our eyes in this moment? God loves you so much. The Bible says that nothing would separate you from the love of God. He loves you so much. No matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you have made, He is there on the shore, not pointing at you with arms wide open saying, hey, don't do life any other way but through me. So if that is you on the count of three and you're either one of those two people that wanna either come back to Jesus or make a first time decision to follow Jesus, I want you to just raise your hand in this place. One, can I tell you that God loves you? Two, there's nothing that you could ever do that would separate you from that. And three, who are those people tonight that say, I wanna commit my heart, my life to Jesus? As I just look from the right to the left, to the front, to the back, I see that hand over there, incredible. Is there anyone else? Just as I look. I'm not gonna rush this moment. If there's anyone else tonight that says, hey, I wanna make that decision to follow Jesus. Incredible. Well, God, we thank You so much for these people tonight. We thank You whether they put their hand up or they made that decision in their heart. Thank You, God, that everything is changing. Your Word says that on that cross, You paid for every bit of sin, every mistake, everything that has weighed us down. And the three days later, You rose again so that we could have a life of hope, of fulfilment, of purpose, so that we could spend eternity with You. So I thank You, God, that those people over their life, the old would be gone and the new would come and they would step into a new day today, a life that is gonna fulfill them, a life that is gonna give them purpose, a life that is not gonna amount to nothing, but is going to amount to everything in Your Name. So God, we thank You for that. And we give You honour and glory for those people tonight in Jesus' mighty Name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, hey, can we put our hands together for those people tonight that made that decision, the greatest decision that you could ever make in your life. And I don't say that just because it's a cliche, but that is honestly the greatest decision that you could ever make.